Hanımlar, beyler, e, hepinize saygı ve sevgilerimizi iletiyoruz. Bugün 7 Aralık 2023 ve Türep ile Yeşil Deniz programının ikinci bölümündeyiz. E, 2050 yılında e, güneş enerjisi ile birlikte dünyanın en ucuz enerji kaynağı olması beklenen deniz üstü rüzgar enerjisi için Çin ve Avrupa ülkeleri ciddi yol almış durumda. Bu alandaki teknolojiyi geliştirmek ve tedarik zincirini oluşturmak için Amerika'nın da son yıllarda dahil olduğu yarış hızlanmış durumda. TÜREP olarak işte tam da bu programla Türkiye'nin deniz üstü rüzgar enerjisi potansiyeli konusundaki farkındalığını arttırmak, bu alanda özellikle Sanayi ve Teknoloji Bakanlığımız ve Enerji ve Tabi Kaynaklar Bakanlığımız tarafından yürütülen çalışmalara katkıda bulunmayı amaçlıyoruz. Aynı zamanda yapacağımız programlarla Türkiye'nin deniz üstü rüzgar enerjisi alanında tabiri caizse bir fotoğrafını çekmek, bu alanda ileride karşılaşabileceğimiz zorlukları ve bunları aşma yollarını yerli ve yabancı konuklarımızla keşfetmeyi amaçlıyoruz, ele almayı amaçlıyoruz. Bunların hepsini bugünkü program konuğum olan Jumbo Consulting Group CEO'su Morten Soyborg ile konuşacağız. Bugünkü programda sadece giriş ve kapanış bölümlerini iki dilde yapacağım. Programın geri kalanı İngilizce dilinde olacak. Ladies and gentlemen, today is December 7, 2023, and we are here to, with the second part of our program, Power of the Wind, Wind Offshore Energy Insights. By 2050, it is anticipated International Energy Agency that offshore wind energy will become one of the cheapest sources of energy. China and European countries have made serious progress in offshore wind and the race to develop the technology and to create the supply chain it has accelerated. As Turkish Wind Energy Association, with this program, we pl plan to raise awareness of Turkey's offshore wind energy potential and contribute to the work carried out by the Ministry of Industry and Technology, as well as the Ministry of Energy and Natural Resources. At the same time, we aim to take a picture of Turkey in the field of wind energy, offshore wind energy, and to discuss the challenges we may face in this field in the future and the ways to overcome them with our local and foreign guests. We will discuss all of these with Martin Soyborg, CEO of Jumbo Consulting Group, who is my guest on today's program. Hi, Morten. Welcome to our program. Hi, Ruk, and uh, nice to be here. A pleasure, uh, and thanks for having me. Um, so, my first question, uh, can you please also introduce yourself and tell us about how did you get involved in the offshore wind energy industry and what motivates you to stay in this field? Sure. <clears throat> As you said in the, uh, in the introduction, uh, my name is Morten uh, Soibo. I'm uh, Copenhagen based uh, out of Denmark and uh, I'm the CEO of, uh, of Jumbo Consulting Group. And uh, just to provide uh, a frame of, of reference, uh, what we do is, uh, as a consultancy is to provide uh, contract advisory uh, procurement and, and contract management services uh, to products uh, globally. We do that out of our eight offices, uh, three in, in Asia Pacific and, and, and five in Europe. And that footprint really uh, says something about us sort of following the, uh, the offshore wind industry obviously going from Europe uh, to the, the wider global market and, uh, and, and, and Asia Pacific and North America as well. So um, I've been working in the offshore wind industry now for, for more than 15 years. Um, when saying that, that makes me feel a bit old, of course. Um, it's been a great ride uh, as it has gone from being one of projects here and there in the North Atlantic Sea uh, to a, uh, a truly uh, global uh, industry. So. Um, a long and wide road, let's say, from, from where I started out uh, to, to where we are now. And um, <clears throat> I started out, my background is legal. Uh, so so that, that, that, that proves that you can, you, can, you can still educate yourself and, and, and, and go beyond sort of uh, your ed educational background to, to other things as we now work more uh, also with uh, um, But when I left uh, university as a, as a, as a graduate uh, and, and got my lawyer's degree, uh, I was fascinated by large scale uh, construction. And since I'm not an engineer and, uh, and actually don't know how to build things, um, I thought I could play my part uh, uh, and support 
the creation of uh, large infrastructure projects uh, as a as a lawyer. So I worked uh, in a in a in a in a big construction uh, company uh, that uh, also had uh, projects in the offshore wind industry uh, at the very beginning, and then moved to Vestas uh, offshore, where I worked for a couple of years before working as a consultant, which I've done for uh, about uh, ten years now. So. So for me, uh, the motivation comes from seeing projects come alive and, uh, and, and, and more and more, of course, uh, be part of the renewable energy industry and uh, support the green uh, transition. That is really my, my, my biggest motivation and, and also that of my team here in Jumbo, Jumbo Consulting Group. Thank you. Yes, uh, helping our one and only uh, world uh, is, is a big motivation for all of us. So. Um, it is estimated that the capex for offshore wind investments has risen up to 30% due to the supply chain bottlenecks mostly. Can you describe the current state of global supply chain and tell us about how to mitigate the bottlenecks in the industry? That's two very big, uh, big questions. Um, so I'll start off by saying it's, uh, it's challenging. Um, <clears throat> for the past years, uh, the offshore wind sector has proven to be uh, a very difficult market for the supply chain to, uh, to navigate and earn a reasonable profit. So uh, as you said in your introduction, the um, industry had to prove that it could reach reasonable levels on the cost of energy and uh, compete with other forms of uh, energy generation. Now, <clears throat> this has induced a lot of pressure on the supply chain to uh, lower the margins and assume risk, which in turn has led to very poor, let's say, financial performance for a lot of different companies. And then <clears throat> when you then add uh, a global pandemic of the wars in Ukraine and now in the Middle East, uh, you have uh, rising interest rates and commodity prices. <clears throat> and then at the same time, uh, through the uh, increased energy prices for fossil fuels, you also have uh, the increased, let's say, competition for capacity from um, the, uh, the oil and gas sector. So that is basically the, the, the recipe for, for the perfect um, storm. Um, <clears throat> so where we are now, I mean, overall, it has worked. I mean, if we look five, 10 years back, we've gone from, offshore wind has gone from being a, a Northern European phenomenon to, to today where we sit with you and, and discuss offshore wind in, in Turkey. Mm -hmm. But uh, obviously we have some, uh, short, let's say, to midterm uh, challenges that we need to uh, to overcome. So um, <clears throat> I would say that, let's say, aside for the macroeconomic and, and political challenges uh, leading to high prices, um, there is a good news. And the good news is that the, um, the appetite uh, for the build out of offshore wind has never been greater. And that means that from a global uh, supply chain perspective, the main challenge as we have it right now is, uh, is bottlenecks. Mm -hmm. um, there's simply not uh, enough uh, capacity and supply to, to, to satisfy uh, the offshore uh, wind built out uh, globally at this point in time. And this is something we see across the board of all major components, uh, works and services. So it's everything from VTGs to foundations, cables, substations, and, and so on. And then not least uh, people. So um, in, in the end, uh, it's great that we uh, have machines and, um, and uh, can fabricate the, the components that we need. But in the end, it's, it's people that are needed to, uh, to, uh, to support the build out. So um, <clears throat> the challenge that we see right now is that increasing the capacity for, for all of these things uh, come with a significant lead time. And uh, that means that uh, the, the prices go up. Uh, and, and there will be a limit uh, to how many projects that can get built for, for the next uh, five to seven uh, years. And then maybe uh, maybe to, to address the second uh, uh, part of your question, of food, and now we're coming sort of to the mitigation and opportunity in this, right? Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> obviously, I think uh, first and foremost, uh, we need uh, political initiatives. And um, you can say the whole sector is, of course, promoted and driven by the overall ambition uh, that stems from uh, security policy and energy policy and the green transition. 
So, um, so, so we know that uh, the appetite is there. Uh, we can see that uh, initiatives are being taken in, in different markets. And, uh, and really what we need is, um, as an industry is, is this long-term commitment, uh, transparent and efficient structures to support uh, the build out of offshore wind. And, and that comes through uh, political uh, structure, which means auctions that allow adjustments to reflect the market dynamics so it doesn't become a race to, to zero. That is particularly needed for floating, as we see it right now, floating wind. We need sort of clear and efficient pathways for permitting, and, and we also need a little bit less uh, protectionism. So uh, every market has their own sort of ambitions for, for, for local content creation, which is, which is good, and, and you should definitely promote and, and, uh, and do as much as you can locally. Um, but it, that also comes with, uh, with a price tag sometimes. So um, if the politi politicians design a, a good structure, then the market will find a way. That's at least my, uh, my sort of uh, take on it, I would say. So um, it's more about the policy framework, as far as I understand, in your point of view. Yeah, even, the, yeah. sorry, sorry, go on. So um, you've, you, you told me at the beginning of your conversation that you've been in the industry for 15 years. And in the Northern Europe, there are many experts who is in the industry for a few decades, at least two, right? Like one, one or two decades. So you have a more or less established market. Even in those markets, now you have bottlenecks. How do you do global supply chain challenges in the offshore wind industry affect emerging markets like Turkey then, like when it comes to us? Well, uh, I think you can you can look at it uh, that there's both maybe bad news and, and good news in that respect, I would say. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of emerging markets, a lot of activity. I mean, we, we see it in uh, in, in, in Asia Pacific, uh, the, the, the Philippines, Vietnam, Japan, you know, aside for the more mature markets in, in Korea and, and Taiwan. Australia can also be mentioned. Same in Europe. Uh, the whole uh, Mediterranean now, along with uh, Turkey, is, uh, is coming along and, and have ambitions for, uh, for offshore wind uh, deployment and, uh, and, and development. Uh, so, so, so let's say the challenges faced by, by, by Turkey are, are the same as, as in, in a lot of these uh, emerging markets. Um, <clears throat> what I think is, is um, and actually what I see is, uh, is that there isn't really a reduced appetite for, for, for the early development. We, we still see a lot of developers being keen on and engaging in uh, finding new markets to invest in so so um, right now we have what i see as a, as a, as a short and, and mid-term uh, challenge to uh, uh, with supply chain, chain bubble bottlenecks where we'll see the more uh, mature and established markets compete for capacity however <clears throat> um, I believe that uh, in Turkey, you're looking to have three gigawatts installed by offshore wind installed by 2035. And uh, I think the good news is, is that hopefully right now, uh, investments will be made in the supply chain and those um, current, let's say, geopolitical challenges that we see will be overcome. So maybe uh, maybe the timing is not too bad for Turkey. And maybe this is uh, actually uh, quite a right if you start uh, taking the right initiatives to establish the infrastructure and the regulatory framework that is needed to support uh, offshore wind development. So actually maybe Turkey is a good place and the time is not too bad for, for, for uh, getting involved in, in, in offshore wind. Okay, I'm happy to hear the good news. <laughs> um, my next question. So we know that offshore wind industry relies heavily on ports and shipyards. And a few months ago, um, uh, I, I read a report uh, in, from US that like it's almost 60% of the total infrastructure investments needed in US um, to create the, the offshore wind industry they were planning. Could you please outline the key differences between the onshore and offshore supply chains, including the talent pool required? I can try at least uh, to give it my my best shot, and um, so so uh, it sort of lies in the in the words, right? Uh, uh, onshore versus uh, offshore. So if we um, if we look at the supply chains, 
Uh, they're very similar for everything uh, that is uh, onshore transmission and, and construction works. So basically, all the markets that we are active in, in Asia Pacific, in the US and in Europe, uh, we see uh, all the onshore works, all the on onshore construction and transmission that is more or less available and uh, can be sort of um, carried out by the, by the local supply chain. So, so that's where we have the similarities between onshore and, and offshore. Uh, then uh, when it comes to, to, to offshore, uh, that's where things get, get, get different. Uh, everything is uh, bigger, the signs are different, the manufacturing facilities that needs to be set, set up specifically for offshore wind uh, are different. And, and then of course you have all the marine uh, transport installation and uh, operation and maintenance scope, uh, which is uh, fundamentally uh, different of course between onshore and, and offshore. And as you mentioned, the, the, the port infrastructure required to do all this. So uh, you're right. Uh, I mean, the scale of things is, is, uh, is, is, is bigger and so are the investments. And, and that is why uh, uh, these uh, investments need to be planned and, uh, and uh, mapped out and initiated early on to facilitate uh, the time <clears throat> where we are ready to do the offshore construction. Um, when it comes to the talent pool, uh, I think you basically need the same um, people in terms of educational backgrounds. I mean, uh, you will definitely need uh, engineers, uh, you will need legal professionals, uh, people with, with a financial, economical background, uh, health and safety, quality, and so on. So <clears throat> the difference is, is not um, your sort of uh, the skill sets needed in terms of educational background. I think the differences come with the uh, access to education that is offshore wind centric and uh, and that you have the opportunity to to get some offshore wind experience on your on your resume. That, those are the two differences. And I think Turkey there is um, is, is in the same position as, as other emerging markets in need for for upskilling and transition of the workforce. Um, and we have the same challenge as Jumbo Consulting Group. I mean, we, uh, as any company in the industry, are, are looking for people that can transition from, let's say, oil and gas or onshore wind or something else into, um, into offshore wind. So we are also investing in education and, uh, and amongst others, uh, what we have is the Renewable Construction Academy that we are partner in. But I think I think um, Turkey is, is ideally placed uh, to transition people from related industries uh, with a large uh, onshore wind portfolio, uh, which I understand is, is 12 gigawatts today. Well, then uh, you, you have some pre-existing knowledge and, and, uh, and, and a good base to, uh, to make that transition work. Yes, we also have a success story on the onshore side related to our industry. I don't know if you know, but Turkish wind energy industry uh, exports 80% of their production, tower, nacelle, and blades. So I hope we can, we will be able to create the same success story in the offshore energy, wind energy field. Um, my last question um, is about like the region. So all country, countries in the Mediterranean have announced significant targets for offshore wind energy generation. Um, in this regard, Turkey also set a goal of achieve, achieving five gigawatt of offshore wind power by 2035, while targets for 2050 are still under internal discussion. Could you please provide more details regarding the infrastructure investments that Turkey needs to attract to meet its own targets and help other countries in the region as well and what advice do you have for emerging markets like Turkey in the offshore wind energy sector? Yeah, I mean, in terms of um, advice and what is needed, uh, I think we touched upon it a bit uh, earlier on. I mean, you definitely need, need that uh, the, the support uh, uh, from the politicians, uh, which means long-term commitment to realize that goal of five gigawatts and a clear roadmap on how to get there. <clears throat> then what we see is often a challenge when it, when it comes to product development is uh, delays 
coming out of permitting processes. So there it's also important to have a, a clear and efficient uh, permitting process uh, mm -hmm. laid out. That is initiative that can be taken now if, if they're not already there. You also need um, some um, energy price assurance mechanisms. <clears throat> I mean, we've seen uh, latest in the UK, for example, where in the CFD round number five, which was the latest auction, there were no bids developments. And they, they the consequences of that and and uh, and uh, and uh, raise the ceiling uh, price uh, for the next upcoming CFD six auction. So we definitely need uh, some some kind of price assurance mechanism so so developers can can have uh, can can de risk and, and can have a, a business case that is transparent and and, and pretty uh, solid. And then of course we have the the, the investments into uh, into infrastructure and and that is where I think. You know, there's some some some possibility. There's no no secret that uh, in a lot of different countries we uh, they experience a lot of uh, challenges because the existing grid infrastructure does not support uh, this um, change in the energy mix and the use of offshore wind for for generation. So they have those challenges in in all the new markets. U.S. as you mentioned, Ireland is another good example, but uh, that is something that passes across the board. So that's that's where I see uh, the the main investments uh, from a let's say uh, infrastructure point of view, but also uh, from the point of view where there is opportunity for the Turkish supply chain. Mm -hmm. So that's the grid infrastructure. It's the uh, port infrastructure that is needed. Uh, it's O and M bases and logistics. And, and then, of course, if you do have existing uh, facilities, uh, such as the capability to fabricate tower, uh, towers nacelles and, and, and, uh, and blades uh, in, in, um, in, in Turkey that can be used also for um, offshore wind uh, projects, that's, of course, great uh, if you can capitalize on that, both for your domestic market and, and more internationally. So. Um, but those are the opportunities as, as I see, sort of short term, and, and uh, uh, I think uh, I probably need to know more about the capabilities of what Turkey has to offer there in terms of shipyards, uh, in terms of uh, ports, and other uh, fabrication facilities. It might be more, mm -hmm. but, but definitely you need you need the you need the grid, you need the port infrastructure to to support the the, the industry in the years to come. Yes, thank you, Morten, um, for your contribution um, to as a as, as a guest to our second program. Um, yeah, I, I'll I'll thank you. I I'll, I thank you for your contribution. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure being here, and uh, I'm happy to attend another time for sure. Okay, great. Thank you, um, dear viewers. Thank you very much for your participation. For those who missed the beginning of the program. I would like to inform you that we will share the recording on our social media, account, media accounts. We wish you all the best uh, till the next program. Uh, değerli izleyenler, katılımınız için teşekkür ediyoruz. Programın başlangıç bölümünü kaçıranlar için e, kaydımız e, online hesaplarımızda, medya hesaplarımızda pay olacak, paylaşacağız. E, YouTube kaydımızda da Türkçe altyazı mevcut olacak İngilizce bölümler için. Türep olarak rüzgarın olduğu her yerde olmaya devam edeceğiz. Bir sonraki programa kadar görüşmek üzere. Sağlıklı günler diliyoruz.